do me a favor, picture your favorite crypto app or exchange. Got it? Now I have five questions for you. Question number one, does your favorite app or exchange have fiat on and off ramps that do not charge you crazy fees? Question number two, does your app actually help you time your investments with machine learning and algorithms? Question number three, does your app or favorite exchange connect to multiple exchanges to get you best rates, best liquidity, but also mitigate the risk of a central failure of one single order book? Question number four, is your favorite app or exchange Swiss made, but also licensed and regulated in the EU so that you can feel 100% reassured, but also sleep well at night? Question number five, is your favorite app or exchange fully aligned with your principles and values, 100% community centric and not VC backed? So if your answer to any of these questions is a no, what are you waiting for? Download the Swissborg Wealth app, join the new era of wealth management and enjoy the ride. Dear crypto community and blockchain buddies across the globe, welcome back to Kryptonites, the no BS blockchain channel built with the community and for the community. And today we have two mind blowing guests, Stacy and Max, the Orange Pill podcast, a media that's taking everything by storm, educating people on the future of finance. Thank you so much, you two, for coming on the show. You are true legends and have been supporting this movement for a very long time. How are you doing today? We are feeling positive about Bitcoin. Yeah, feeling good. And before we kick off, a big shout out to Crypto Slate for always releasing awesome articles. Our great partners, we love you very much. And the very first question, Max, you've been an advocate since the very early days when there were tons of naysayers from 2012, 2013. You had videos on YouTube. I would love to kick off with a simple high level question. Why Bitcoin? Why are you guys so much in love with this phenomenon? Right. Well, we started covering it in 2011 when it was a dollar on Kai's report. And uh, for me, it was a continuation of the work I was doing in the mid 90s when I invented uh, virtual currencies at that time. And uh, this solved the centralization problem when I saw the white paper. So I got interested in it, started buying Bitcoin at a dollar, realized it was going to probably take a, a run at gold as a reserve currency. And that's when things got really great. For me, you know, it's been an amazing 10 year journey, which, you know, back in 2011, there was very, very, very little press other than us about Bitcoin. So, you know, it, it was you were feeling your way in the dark. Certainly I was, you know, trying to figure out what this thing was. And it's. You know, I'm so happy to be in the space now. And, and, and in a way, a lot of people say, oh, they, you know, they're so jealous of us for being in at 2011. And I'm like, you know what? It was a lot more difficult back then. And it was easy to get wrecked. It was easy to lose your coins. It was easy to uh, not understand at all what, what you had in your possession, like how valuable it actually was. So, you know, it's a good time to get in now as well, because there's just so much more content around explaining what it is. Absolutely. And the decentralized point that you guys mentioned, would love to hear the different kind of characteristics of Bitcoin that really excites you. And to put it into perspective today, guys, we're going to look at Bitcoin versus other assets and how Bitcoin can fare against others. And I'd love to kick off with a very simple topic that everyone is familiar with with regard to the US dollar. I know you two have been talking about the rise and the end of the US dollar and possible scenarios. And even some people, some economists out there are predicting that the US dollar could lose up to 20% of its value by the end of 2021. Maybe a bit exaggerated, but uh, could you guys comment on that? Max, if you want to kick off, we'd love to hear your views on this. Right, well, no fiat money over the past 300 years has survived. They've all crashed at least 99% in value. So I would expect the U.S. dollar to go down a similar path of losing 99 to 100 percent of its value. That's it's almost baked into the cake. I don't think it would be surprising if that wasn't the situation. So in the in the case of um, the U.S. dollar going forward versus Bitcoin, you know, the U.S. dollar, as Paul Krugman at the New York Times says, is backed by violence. Bitcoin is backed by peace. Uh, fiat money has not, not it, it's the state's version of money and Bitcoin separates the state from money. So that, those are two major characteristics that separate Bitcoin from fiat money. So fiat money, it's backed by violence, it's backed by the state, and it has a 100% probability of becoming worthless. 
Bitcoin is separate from the state. It is, um, it is backed by love and it has 100% probability of becoming the prominent dominant world reserve currency. Beautifully put, Stacy. Well, I kind of feel like 2008 was the end of the US dollar that started in 1971 when we went off the gold standard. And 2008 was when the banking system collapsed under the weight of the fraud of that fiat system. It's no coincidence then that the Bitcoin white paper was published just, just a few weeks after the collapse of Lehman Brothers. And then in 2009, the fate of the US dollar was sealed when Obama pulled Iran off the SWIFT system. So that was the, again, the acceleration of the end of the dollar. Because as soon as you, you know, if you, you can't have the world's reserve currency and be partisan and start ripping countries off the grid, that's not what payment rails are about. So that was also when Bitcoin was actually birthed into the world and actually mined into the world. So I think, you know, the development of Bitcoin into a broader and broader base around the world, a very fair distribution, a lot to do with Kaiser Report airing all over the world, it dubbed into Spanish. And, you know, since it was two, three dollars that people around the world have heard of it. But the, I, I think these two have, have been going hand in hand, I think, because most people look at an all fiat world. So it's hard to tell that these currencies are collapsing. But the dollar has hyperinflated against Bitcoin, which is the only like honest standard around the world at the moment. So you have seen that all currencies have hyperinflated, all fiat currencies have hyperinflated against Bitcoin. And the dollar is, I mean, it is like wheelbarrow money right now in Bitcoin. You know, that story really touches my heart, Stacey, because my father happens to be Iranian and lives in Tehran. And not only the sanctions made him lose his job, so he's, he's out of a job because he was working in an oil refinery. And uh, on top of that, I can't even send money to a bank account. You know, I can't even help him with his money. The COVID situations don't let me travel there. So it really troubled my family personally and myself. And Bitcoin has been a resort. There's a way to send Bitcoin over to Iran. And then from Iranian banks, we'll convert it to the local real. So um, yeah, it, that means a lot. Uh, any comments on that, Max? You know, I, I see you nodding a lot. I know, it's just, uh, it's, it's, it's accurate. You know, the, the 2009 event with Iran is, is a seminal event in the rise of Bitcoin and the fall of the dollar. Thank you so much for sharing that. So Bitcoin relative to the US dollar. Next, I'd love to ask you about altcoins versus Bitcoin. And this is something you covered a lot as well, Max and Stacy. And I know you guys are pro, pro Bitcoin, but could you let us a little bit, know a little bit more about what are your thoughts on Bitcoin? Kind of is the mother of the crypto asset space and recently also created the CBDCs. But what is your overall view and why is Bitcoin the, the strongest form of crypto that we have out there? Bitcoin is money and a gold substitute and everything else is gambling, right? People who are trading in altcoins are gambling and gambling is a big business. You know what I mean? That's if you want to gamble, gamble, but you can't, there's no comparison. There's nothing to equate the two. It'd be like equating gold with the number seven on a roulette wheel at Caesar's Palace, right? One is money, one is gambling. So um, if you like to gamble, go, go, go and gamble, you know, I mean, but it has nothing to do with Bitcoin. There's not, there's not, there's not in the same universe. And I would add to that, you know, in 2011 to 2014, 15, there were a lot of the first of the altcoins really emerging. Uh, Litecoin used to be considered a, you know, test net for Bitcoin. Perhaps back then there were some, um, it was understandable that people were launching altcoins because it, you know, like I said, we were all like walking around in the dark trying to feel around what Bitcoin was. And we still didn't understand the whole process of this consensus algorithm. Not until 2017 in the hard fork did it really, was it a major light bulb moment where instantaneous knowledge was transmitted across the world that why, why Bitcoin worked why the consensus algorithm was needed you know so back in 2011 2012 13 14 you know people were still trying to think oh you know this is interesting bitcoin is this and now but we want smart contracts and you know bitcoin was always always had that ability 
but it's like such a slow development because security of the protocol and the network is priority. So we're glad now that that, that Bitcoin stayed slow and steady, but at the, those early altcoins, you know, they were, tr they were trying to do something because they didn't understand that Bitcoin could already do it. And anything coming up now is, is again, a, a kind of a, a dishonest version of, of those early altcoins, because I, I don't think, you know, Bitcoin's not going to be able to do anything that, you know, they, Bitcoin could do anything that any of these other things try to say that they're all about that. That makes a lot of sense. Thanks so much for sharing your thoughts on that. And obviously, so altcoins is not something that you guys fully see potential in, but I, I have heard some positive comments relative to gold and silver. I know, Max, that you, you do believe in, in commodities. And could you let us a little know, uh, know a little bit more about how does Bitcoin position itself against, for example, gold and silver and why you still think those have potential in terms of assets? Right. Well, Bitcoin is now replacing gold. So I think we're seeing that in the market. Gold is uh, is flatlining against Bitcoin, and the industry is moving. Sovereigns are moving to uh, Bitcoin. Corporations are moving to Bitcoin. And if you if you remove gold's use as a store of value from the marketplace, then it wouldn't be trading above aluminum, right? So gold is becoming the new aluminum because the market is uh, speaking. And the market sends out signals. And uh, to be able to separate signal from noise is a skill that people can acquire. And um, what it's telling us is that Bitcoin is usurping gold. That means that implies a, a minimum price target of Bitcoin of 500,000 a coin. But I think we got to start expanding that uh, to, to be really a lot higher at this point because I don't think gold five, 10 years from now is, is going to catch any bid at all. People, people are going to throw their gold in the gutter like they're throwing the Venezuelan Bolivar in the gutter. Very nicely put. Stacey, any comments on that? I think Max has said it best long ago where he said Bitcoin is like the black hole in the store value monetary mm -hmm. financial universe sucking in all else. You know, Max had created the Hollywood Stock Exchange, and in 1996, he had the patent on the virtual specialist technology and a virtual currency, one of the first digital currencies. And that had the problem of this digital currencies of centralization, how to decentralize it. Uh, Bitcoin came up with the answer. And now Bitcoin, like I said, you know, Bitcoin evolves. Like it, as it gets bigger and bigger, it takes in more and more of the monetary universe. And now it's starting to swallow the store of value story that has lasted for 5,000 years for gold. Gold did an amazing job for 5,000 years, but I do think now Bitcoin is starting to swallow that universe as well. Very cool. I know you mentioned Bitcoin as the renaissance, uh, which is a very nice term for those watching out there in French, that means the rebirth. But uh, in terms of Bitcoin itself, so you mentioned earlier, Max, you talked about the, the actual value and a lot of people debate on whether Bitcoin has fundamental value. What are the properties and characteristics of Bitcoin that really make you feel like, yes, there is this value and this is why I'm so confident that uh, the Bitcoin has such a, a bright future, as we say? Well, it doesn't have any utility or intrinsic value. So I think the Mises regression theorem has been proven wrong, first by my patent in 1996, and now by Bitcoin. And the fact that gold has, or perceived to have some utility value, and even more so for silver, is why they're stuck in a rut, because mm -hmm. they're not being valued subjectively pure uh, by pure subjective valuation by the market. So because Bitcoin essentially has no utility at all, except to be a perfect store of value and to engender perfect price discovery, then um, it has the value is the perfect price for the market. The market's telling us that we want something that's perfect, hard money store of value. We don't want utility of anything other than that. That's all we want, which makes sense because you can separate the state from money if you get that. And once you separate state from money, then you also remove another huge piece of utility value, like paying your taxes, for example, get rid of that. Okay, because that also is a pure price discovery. So um, the fact that it has no utility value whatsoever is why it's so valuable. For one thing, this is something like, for example, like Peter Schiff, for example, many times he'll say, well, gold has utility value, and I have gold cufflinks, and therefore it has something 
you know, and he, he obviously never read Mises or he misinterpreted Mises or no, he never read Carl Munger. Yeah, you know, Carl Munger. Carl Munger. Carl Munger set out the blueprint for this. Um, the Rothbards and the Mises came along and they kind of bastardized um, uh, the, the original Austrian school vision, in my view. And so we're getting back to that original vision with Bitcoin. Very nicely put. Stacey, anything you would like to add? I'll pick up on that, that Carl Menga said all value is subjective. Mm. So it all, all value derives from human consciousness. And if Bitcoin is a renaissance in consciousness, it's all in our conscience. And that can be taken. You know, an idea can't be killed. Uh, you know, you could throw a man in prison, but you can't destroy his spirit, right? That's, that's the thing is, you know, the government can seize your assets. They can seize your home. They can seize your gold. They can seize your fiat dollars out of your bank account in order to pay taxes or fines or whatever that they deem you owe them. But they can't seize what's up here. And what's up here is your Bitcoin. Very nicely put. And that leads me to a question since we're talking about Peter Schiff. You know, Ray Dalio recently made some comments as well. Max and Stacey, you probably saw that Bitcoin will be ended by the government, et cetera, et cetera. And obviously, Warren Buffett is someone you commented on in the past, Max, where you talked about his his reaction of rat poison squared, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, well, what is your response to the people like this who say, yeah, there's no intrinsic value, as you mentioned right now? Obviously, you kind of answered this in the previous question, but how do you respond to Ray Dalio and some of you know the, the traditional legends that just really still don't see it even in 2020? Well, in terms of uh, the state getting involved in banning Bitcoin, what we're seeing is the exact opposite. Yeah. We're seeing, and I pointed this out now almost three years ago, we're going to see a global hash war. So governments and states are going to be competitively mining and hoarding mm. Bitcoin, not banning Bitcoin. Yeah. It's like the Sputnik moment when the U.S. entered the space race. This is now the Bitcoin moment where the U.S. is the comptroller of the currency in the U.S. As a matter of fact, made this point last week that Bitcoin represents a geostrategic asset that the America needs to get involved with immediately or fall by the wayside. So that's that's what we're seeing. So Ray Dalio is categorically wrong. Uh, that's probably why his fund is down 18% this year, is that he doesn't really know what he's doing anymore. Uh, Warren Buffett is a guy who's been bailed out by the state over a dozen times. If you strip out the bailouts of, of his performance, he's, out, he's underperforming a money market fund for 30 years. So there's another guy I wouldn't place any value on his opinion either. Um, and um, Peter Schiff is, you know, is the gift that keeps on giving. He's like a pinata that's <laughs> eating itself. It's a self-beating pinata. Instead of beating the pinata and getting the candy, Peter Schiff beats himself and the candy falls out. So it's beautiful. It's a self-beating virtuous cycle of stupidity. <laughs> lovely, 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 Stacey. <laughs> yeah, Ray Dalio and especially Warren Buffett are cantillionaires, right? This is those closest to the Fed get all the free money. And, you know, at a, at a certain point, you, nobody wants to say, oh, you know, I'm a multi-billionaire because the Fed steals money from the people and gives it to me. You want to think like you're somehow like you have some sort of unique ability that you deserve this wealth. So you know, they're invested in that system, the Cantillion effect system. They're invested in the fiat system because it's given them all that they have that has placed them above the vast majority of the world's population. So it makes sense that why would Warren Buffett, as Max said, like he's been bailed out so often, especially in 2008 during that financial crisis and Chancellor and Brink, the second bailout for banks, all those bailouts were bailing out all the financial services and insurance companies that Warren Buffett owned at the time. He is, however, I mean, I, I don't know if he'll ever publicly say I'm going to go into Bitcoin, but his, he is maneuvering in a way which is accepting the reality that we're in a new renaissance. We're at the end of the fiat dark ages and the beginning of a new fiat, a, a, a new Bitcoin renaissance in that he's dumping all of his bank stocks like he's held these for decades. He's dumping those fiat bank stocks. He's, he, he did go long on Barrick Gold, which is the biggest gold miner in the world. Um, he's, he's since scaled back his position, but he, he's positioning against 
the U.S. fiat system. He's gone long. Japan, a, a huge percentage of his uh, portfolio is now in Japanese uh, conglomerates. And so with the gold position and he owns Apple as well. But, he, you know, he's basically positioning without conceding defeat as well. Like he's he, he won't do the whole uh, 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 he won't concede defeat on Bitcoin. But the likes of J.P. Morgan recently have, you know, Jamie Dimon has been dissing gold, I mean, been dissing Bitcoin for so long. And now they're, the, the bank itself, not Jamie Dimon necessarily, are saying, are conceding defeats on that. So is Bank of America. So is uh, Citibank. Very nicely put. You're such a perfect, you're the dynamic duo, the two of you. I just love the way you complete each other. <laughs> the perfect team, literally. And I'd love to transition on one of the last themes, which is the CBDCs. And obviously, this is something that Noriel Rubini, since we're talking about some big names out there in the space, says that the CBDC will crush Bitcoin because Bitcoin is nothing else than a partial store of value. Uh, Stacy, if you'd like to comment on, on that, and then Max would love to hear your views as well. It sounds to me like Noriel Rubini is projecting. A lot of people are get very uh, jealous and envious and, and angry that when they were told about Bitcoin at $5, $10, $100, $1,000, as Noriel Rubini has been told and had the opportunity to buy Bitcoin and invest in Bitcoin and participate in Bitcoin since those days, like he keeps getting it wrong. So his only last hope is that somehow the, like, be, the central banks, the governments, the world organizing bodies that they somehow crush his enemies who he sees as Bitcoin. So that it seems like projection to me that he's just projecting some sort of fantasy that he has, but no, central bank digital currencies, <laughs> uh, you know, it's just fiat. It's, 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 it's no different from the fiat system we have now. Right, when, with Nouriel, I mean, the problem he has, as does Joseph Stiglitz and others, they are academics. And so they're trapped by their own dialectics and their <laughs> legacy paradigm, mm. right? He's seeing it in terms of the legacy system. And as an academic, a professional academic at New York University, right. he can't just step out of that worldview and speak having transcended it in a way that his, his, uh, his, the people who keep him at his job and his students and the faculty and everyone would immediately point a finger at him and claim heresy, right? He, he would be considered a Galileo or a Copernicus who went outside the system con completely to look at the system and were deemed heretical and their careers were over. They went to prison or, or nearly. So Rubini has this problem, you know, he's, it was great in the world of academia where he could be uh, the guy on the sidelines and throwing rocks at the established. The same thing, Paul Krugman has the same problem, right? They, they can, they 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 kind of challenge the accepted wisdom in a way that under underlies and buttresses the accepted wisdom, right? They're not really challenging anything ever. So that's his particular problem. In the money management field, nobody wants to be the first mover and lose any money and then get blackballed by the industry. Mm -hmm. That was cured by Paul Tudor Jones. So Paul Tudor Jones made it safe to buy Bitcoin in the hedge fund industry. Michael Saylor made it safe to buy industry and in, in, safe to buy Bitcoin in the corporate Perfect. boardroom mm. in the cash management CIO, CFO space. Mm. In the academic field, I'm trying to think of an academic who has made Bitcoin safe for academics to talk about. And at the moment, I know there must be one. Yanis Varoufakis has a similar problem. He's, deep, he's an academic. He can't say anything about Bitcoin because he would be thrown out of the university. Oh, I know who. Uh, Safe Dina Moose. Yeah, I was going to say Safe Dina Moose. He's a professor of, of, of uh, economics and academia. Yeah. And he wrote the Bible on Bitcoin, the Bitcoin standard, right? Yeah. So he, you know, he made it safe for academics and smart people to understand Bitcoin, but not many have followed in his path yet. Uh, but, you know, they sh really should read the book, study the book, and understand the book. And then they can have a moment of, well, they can save their careers if they, or they can go down with the ship. Either way, <laughs> uh, Bitcoin doesn't care. You know, it doesn't. You know, I think it was uh, a famous physicist uh, who was uh, part of the discovery of quantum physics, Neil Bohr's. He said, "When will this idea be accepted?" 
And he said, uh, it'll be accepted one funeral at a time. <laughs> you know, I'm paraphrasing, but you know, in other words, these, these ideas are hard cooked in people's minds and they, they take them to the grave. They don't, it's hard to change the way you think. Awesome. Stacey, Max just mentioned some really important names and great advocates and ambassadors for Bitcoin. Are there any other names that come to your mind that you feel are really worth, you know, mentioning because they've done tremendous work on top of what you've done in this space to really educate the world on Bitcoin? Well, we got some really great folks coming in, like Robert Breedlove. Robert ah, Breedlove. Breedlove, um, yeah. Well, I Robert wanted to Breedlove. say, you know, there is a lot of focus on the Michael Saylors and the, the you know, the giant whales like Paul Tudor Jones and BlackRock and stuff. But the ordinary person with just a hundred, you know, a thousand Satoshis to their name are also super, super important. And a lot of them are in our Telegram group, Orange Pill. So you go t.me forward slash Orange Pill. You see six and a half thousand people. Who knows? You know, they're all people use pseudonyms, so we don't know. You know, it could be it could be Michael. Say it could be Paul Tudor Jones in there for all we know. But there, you know, everybody who is a Bitcoiner is a Bitcoiner. It doesn't matter if you have half a billion. Well, now close to a billion dollars worth of Bitcoin, like Michael Saylor does, or maybe you have like. One Bitcoin, like maybe Ali Kanani, Bitcoin lady in, in, in Botswana has. So I think, you know, the Bitcoin is the entirety of the community. There were some, uh, you know, with the user activated software, the ordinary person, the ordinary user of Bitcoin, not the mega thinkers, the giant brains like Safe Dean or Robert Breedlove, but the ordinary user, the, the person operating their node, they determined the fate of Bitcoin beyond all the whales, beyond the, the, the top dogs of Bitcoin at that time in 2017, they took control and they they made Bitcoin what it is today. So there are amazing people involved, um, but those those are the best people there, the ordinary user, the user activated software sort of people. Yeah, so true, so true. And I do think like, you know, you just need one Satoshi. Like as soon as you own a few Satoshis, a, a dollar's worth, ten dollars worth you know it does put you on a you're you're equal to michael mm. sailor and i think he would agree as well like you're a bitcoiner and that it's it's all up here it's all your consciousness and i think that's important i also want to say like i'm excited that um you know closet coiner sean ono lennon came out on a on orange pill podcast just this past weekend you know I also want to say, uh, you know, Closet Coiner, Sean Ono Lennon came out on a recent episode of Orange Pill Podcast, and he revealed that he has been a Bitcoiner since 2011. Nice. You know, we were with him in Paris in 2011, uh, talking Bitcoin at that time. So, you know, when I, I think artists are just as important as the hedge fund managers and the asset fund managers like BlackRock, like they're just as important. All these people, whether the person with a thousand Satoshis, the artists, the, the fund managers, we're all, you know, we are a community, a global community. That makes a lot of sense. And there are some t-shirts actually say we're all Satoshi, right? As long as we contribute to the actual ecosystem. And uh, I would love to ask you, and one of the last questions is, you know, this show is called Kryptonites because imagine Bitcoin is a Superman. There's always a Kryptonite. Like, what is the next challenge for Bitcoin? Where would you like to see Bitcoin in one, two, five years from now? What is that ultimate obstacle that you would really like to uh, see Bitcoin just blast through and, and reach what it's supposed to reach in the future? I'd love to start with you, Max, if that's okay. Right. Well, I have an, a different view on this in that um, I don't think, I, I, I don't necessarily believe that as Bitcoin achieves these incredible price levels, 100,000, 500,000, it doesn't mean that humans are going to be around. You know, I think that, you know, Bitcoin doesn't need him. That it can get all the energy it needs without humans. And it's going to keep hashing. And I think, um, so it's, it's here. If we, if we want to change, you know, I say that you don't change Bitcoin, Bitcoin changes you. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you, we can change to accept the spiritual quality of Bitcoin and go forward or not. But the, the risk is extinction. And we already see extinction is happening. You know, uh, we've had many life extinct, uh, uh, extinction events on planet Earth over the years. I think seeing one right now, right? So the ecosystem is, is collapsing quite rapidly in all aspects of it. Soil, air. 
we call the call of the bio uh, dome, the biosphere that keeps us alive. I mean, it's rapidly deteriorating. So um, we have it. It's already Bitcoin's already. On, and it's on a vector that's on like a comet that's going off into the millennial, you know, off into millions of years into the future on this vector. It started. You know, we can join the spaceship Bitcoin or not. It doesn't care. You know, it could. It could it could be something that an alien civilization finds. You know, Bitcoin is at a hundred million dollars in old U.S. dollars. It's humans have long since become extinct. There's a bunch of chipmunks chattering around a server somewhere, <laughs> and uh, you know, aliens show up and they're like, "Holy shit! Look at all this Bitcoin. These people are really fucking stupid to leave all this behind." <laughs> Lovely, put your narratives and stories are so entertaining, Max. Any comments on that, uh, Stacey? It's only individual human consciousness that you yourself, it's up to you whether you can accept Bitcoin. You know, we we're, we are exiting a fiat dark ages. You see that with the fiat aristocrats. They're already uh, exiting. You have the likes of BlackRock. You have the hedge funds. Those guys are fiat aristocrats and they're abandoning the fiat king. So, you know, the, the, the likes of Stan Druckenmiller you know, he was with Soros when they took down the pound and, and crashed the Bank of England, essentially. You know, those guys are betting against the fiat system. And you have to be ready for it. Like you see all the time, people spend so much of their energy. And this is what the fiat world, you know, the sort of fiat economy, we waste a lot of time and energy eating bad food, consuming bad television. Uh, filled with so much negativity about all the things you cannot do because there are so many toll booths and toll booth operators and neo feudalism in that system that you're used to be, you're like abused as a prisoner in that system where you can't do anything, you can't rise above your station. And Bitcoin is, you know, you have to be ready to believe in yourself, like that you can be whatever you want to be because you have to be whatever you want to be. If you want some of this Bitcoin, if you want people to part with their Bitcoin and give it to you, you better have something of value. And, you know, there's no greater value than you, your, your belief in yourself. And obviously, so Orange Pill Podcast, we're going to put a link here below. It's one of the coolest podcasts in the crypto space. And I'd love to ask you a little bit about Swan as well. Could you, could you both let us know a little bit about Swan before we, we end this interview? That'd be great. Well, swanbitcoin.com forward slash Stacy is, is my, <laughs> it's brand new. It's been Max, we've been sending people to the Max, uh, the forward slash Max for the last few weeks, but I'm so happy that I have my own referral. Well, you know, again, the, these are guys, well, look at their board of advisors, look at their whole team. These are people who are totally orange pill, but beyond just those, um, those dreary sort of ideas of early you know, uh, of, of all the conversations still happening around Bitcoin, of it, uh, you know, is it a payments rail? Is it a medium of exchange? Is it a store of value? Like we're already beyond that. We're like, it's, it's, it's the big thinkers of Bitcoin. And I think that's the most important to me right now for me personally, and it's pure Bitcoin. They, they have no altcoins. There's no uh, distraction from that. It's, it's a pure way to overcome all of your fear and FOMO and all that sort of stuff, dollar cost average into Bitcoin, remove your coin from, the, from your wallet there and, and put it into, you know, either like a multi-sig wallet at, at like keys.casa or, you know, your hardware wallet, Tracer, Ledger or whatever. But, you know, it, I just like, I love swanbitcoin.com forward slash Stacy. <laughs> if you follow that, you will get $10 worth of Bitcoin. Right. And I, I was just saying that if you got one dollar's worth of Bitcoin, you're a Bitcoiner. So if you just register and qualify there, you know, you have to be a U.S. investor. But if you go there, you get ten dollars worth of Bitcoin that, you know, that that's going to you're going to be like a pretty big uh, fish in that uh, Bitcoin sea in another year or two on, on just that ten dollars worth of Bitcoin yeah, today. Yeah. So I like their ethos. I like their um, their positivity. I like their. Um, you know, that they want to help any Bitcoiner, whether you only have $10 worth or $10 million worth. Again, like my experience with them, with Corey Clipston, who's the CEO and founder, is that, you know, there's a, a genuine uh, love of Bitcoin. 
Max, is it okay yeah, for you, yeah, Stacy's yeah, link? Uh, <laughs> yeah, Swan Bitcoin is uh, it's a great on ramp. You know, this is something that was kind of missing. It's a little bit difficult for people to get some Bitcoin. And the Swan just, you know, that's their main focus is we want to be the on ramp. Uh, the prices are incredibly competitive, much better than Coinbase. And, you know, we don't like Coinbase because their ethos is very bad there. There's too much shit coinery and it's no good. Uh, Swan is, uh, prices are great. And at swanbitcoin.com forward slash max, you do get <laughs> when you sign up with someone. All I can say is uh, the battle of the links. We got, uh, we've got a bit of a rivalry going here. <laughs> I, can't, I can't offer anything more than that $10 free Bitcoin. Uh, I guess the winner is the user. You know, any, you go down either path and you're a winner. I mean, this is the casino that nobody loses versus uh, the fiat world or altcoins where everybody loses. Absolutely. We'll put both links and we'll see who gets, uh, since we've been talking about battles throughout this episode, we'll have the battle of the yeah. links for you guys. My link first. Okay. All right. Stacy's link first and then Max's link under. <laughs> oh, no. We're like in Hollywood. <laughs> but I really must say, I'm, I have to give you guys a huge huge thank you to both you max and stacy for orange pill podcast and for contributing so much in the space for really bringing it to the mainstream to the traditional world as well and bridging the gap of both worlds guys you had it today we had the legendary max and stacy from orange pill podcast don't forget to check their podcast it really has finely curated content amazing guests and lots of awesome themes we'll put a link in the description box below and today we gave you guys some amazing content with bitcoin literally versus every single asset that matters out there for you to make a better judgment hopefully in the future thank you so much don't forget we premiere every wednesday eight o'clock gmt at a pc near you thank you so much guys